All right, greetings to the Bears Hall of Discipline today. We are here for Bible and bodybuilding with Bear Paw. The bodybuilding we're going to do today is spiritual bodybuilding. And we are picking up in 2 Kings chapter 12. A very, very young king takes the throne. And for the most part, he does a very good job during his reign. Uh, as long as he had a good counselor, a good, a good friend, a godly friend, a good man. So with that, we pick up in our Old Testament Bible studies in 2 Kings chapter 12, verse 1. In the seventh year of Jehu, Joash began to reign. Forty years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Zebiah of Beersheba. Jehu was in the northern kingdom, ruling from Samaria, the ten tribes in the north. In the southern kingdom, for the most part, Judah and Benjamin, in the southern regions of the land of Israel. So Jehu is ruling in the north, and Jehoash is ruling in the south. Very young king. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. All his days wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. So right off the bat, we're kind of getting a very good king. While he had Jehoiada, the good high priest, guiding him. It's just a... It's a little side note. It's a preface to be on guard about. So all in all, he was a good king. However, the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burnt incense on the high places. They were... Worshipping God in uns unprescribed places and manners and so forth and so on. And he tolerated it. He didn't feel it was important to crack down on that. It wasn't that they were cracking down on, you know, idolatry and them pagan uh, rituals it's just they were worshiping God in unprescribed manners in the high places because they wanted to. He didn't really push the boundaries to enforce that. Good, bad, or ugly, it's just the way it was. So we move on. And Joash said to the priest, All the money of the dedicated things that are brought into the house of the Lord, even the money, every one that passes the account, the money that every man has set, and all the money that cometh into any man's heart to bring into the house of the Lord. Let the priest take it to them, every man, his acquaintance, and let them repair the damage to the house of the Lord. So that was early in his rulership. And so many years go by. They were taking the money, putting it in their pockets, in their clay jars, or putting it under their mattresses, or whatever they did with it. And it says, the 23rd year of the king, they still hadn't repaired the breaches of the house. Now, I can kind of understand that. I have an old Victorian home here in North America and Wisconsin. 
little town called Houstisford. And we bought a lot of, uh, how shall we say, historical weathering and damage that came with the house that we weren't aware of. So it's an old Victorian built in the 1800s. And then after the 1800s, they put on a couple more additions to it. So it's been kind of hammered, nailed together. And once we inherited it, you know, many, many years later, almost 200 years later, there's a lot of things that were just kind of nailed over, painted over, so forth. So the, the repairs, you know, after living in this house for 22 years, it just doesn't really seem to end. You know, you just, you just keep on going from one thing to the next. So I can kind of understand what they're saying. This, this temple has been built um, long ago. And now there's weathering from sun, rain, hailstorms, wind. There's damage. And so they're collecting the money to do the repairs, but they haven't done the repairs. So that's a, that's a little bit of... You know, you know what that is. Collecting the money, but not really putting it where it belongs. So it comes to the king's attention. Verse 7. Then King Joash called for Jehoiada the priest and the other priests and said unto them, Why repair ye not the breaches of the household of the Lord? Why? Why you've been collecting the money? Should have been going to the lumber yard and the, you know, the hardware stores and the concrete people and the mortar people and the timber people up in the woods to bring down more, you know, trees of Lebanon and cedars to do the repairs and up maybe polishing the gold and so forth. But they haven't been doing it. They've just been taking the money to do it, but. They've just been using the money for other things. So he comes, kind of confronts the priest, Jehoiada, and says, why are you not repairing the breaches of the house? Now, stop taking the money from the people to repair the house, because you guys are not repairing the house. So we're going to have a new, we're going to have a shakeup of the financing here. So the priest consented not to accept any more money. So they're going to do something different now. They're going to take a big box, like an ark, and they're going to put a hole in it for dropping the money in, and that is going to be made for the repairs of the temple. So that's the way they're going to do it. And when the money goes in the box, they're to count it, give a tally, an accounting of it. So that it's, so they can monitor it. It's not just a free for all of, you know, everybody taking a little bit and no repairs are being done. So now they're gonna, now they're gonna assess it, take the money, do an accounting of it, and then divvy up the monies where it should go to the masons, the carpenters, you know, the construction guys, the timber guys, the the stone cutters up in the mountains, to everything they need to the right places. The preachers and the priests get their cut, but the construction people also are going to get their cut this time around. So they made a chest and bored a hole in the lid of it and set it behind and beside the altar on the right side as one cometh into the house of the Lord. And the priests that kept the door were to watch it all that was put into the box. They were, so they were kind of like the guards of the money box. And when it was so, when they saw that there was much money in the chest that the king's scribe and the high priest came and they put up the money in bags and they counted the money and took a tally and did, get in, did an accounting. The counting guys get involved now and they do the counting. The scribes, the lawyers, the priests, and all that. They all get together and say, this is how much. 
So, verse 11. Now they gave the money, being told into the hands of them that did the work, and the overseeing of the house of the Lord, and they laid it out to the carpenters and builders, and brought it upon the house of the Lord for the work. To the masons, the hewers of stone, the timber guys in the mountains to buy timber, hewed stone to repair the breaches of the house of the Lord for all that was laid up for the house of the Lord to repair it. So they had a, a bigger bite of the pie than we would do. We would go to one, you know, main general contractor and then he would get all the subcontractors involved. But now we have, you know, we got timber guys. We have the lumberjacks in the mountains. We got the stone cutters in the mountains. We've got the people that are, you know, running the forges and making the nails and the hinges and and the casting guys, you know, making up the the uh, forms and the molds uh, for the, you know, for the various things that need to be remade or melted down or polished or whatever. So verse 12, now we're just going to read here. To the masons and the hewers of stone to buy timber, hewed stone to repair the breaches for the house of the Lord and for all that was laid up for the house to repair it. Howbeit, there were not made for the house of the Lord bowls of silver, snuffers, basins, trumpets, and any vessels of gold or vessels of silver of the money that was brought into the house of the Lord because they weren't quite swimming in the money anymore so they didn't have everything plated and covered in gold and then remade what was already made because Things were a little tighter than what they were during the time of Solomon and David That when they stored up all those riches. We're kind of moving on down the line now where they've paid off a lot of things with that money. And that's what happens. So we're farther on down the, the tree. So they didn't remake a lot of the stuff that they made before. They left it as is. And some of the stuff that was carried off uh, by Shishak and various other, you know, invaders to the land um, were let to be gone for now. So they gave the money to the workmen and repaired, therefore, therewith, the house of the Lord. Moreover, they reckoned not with the men into whose hand they delivered the money to be stowed on the workmen, for they dealt faithfully. They were trustworthy men. That's hard to find now. You know, you get an insurance company, you know, first thing there's a, a fire or a car damage or, you know, where you actually have a, a, you know, you need them and they drop you and they don't fulfill what you've been paying on for years. It's hard to find a, somebody that they always say, we're a family, but they're not really. They're just going to take your money till you actually need them and then they drop you and then they don't really fulfill what you paid them for. So it's hard to find faithful businesses, you know, insurance companies, that kind of thing. They're, they're, it's just hard. The trespass money and the sin money was not brought into the house of the Lord for repairs. It was the priests. In other words, they didn't take all the money that went into the house just for the repairs. They made sure the preacher got his money so he could take care of his family and his mommies and daddies and grandpas. And, you know, his money was secure. That That's number one. You know, they, you got to feed your preachers and pastors and lay people that are involved in, in labors on the church because nothing is free in life. So they made sure to take care of them. Now, there's a little, that's great. Everything that's happened is great now. Now there's a change. There's a change. Verse 17 is like a, the end of a great, you know, book or show or story. And, and it's happy. And all of a sudden, something very bad happens. You know, there's like things just kind of come unraveled. Verse 17. Comes this king of Syria. He is an enemy of Israel. 
He came up earlier in our studies in the Old Testament. And he was cruel. He was a king of one of the regions of Syria. So that you have Syrians, you have Assyrians, you have a lot of uh, ruling nations, the Hittites and all that, that scrolled up into what we call now Turkey. It was Asia Minor and New Testament times. They had a whole bunch of different names, but they were considered Syria. But there was more than just one Syrian. You know, there was various sects of the Syrian. When I say, uh, I mean like states, different states of the Syrians. You know, they had one state of Syria, had Hazael, another one had another one who had peace with Israel. You know, there was different states of Syria. You know, sometimes the Bible just says Syria. But this Hazael, king of Syria, he was, he was an enemy. And he went up to fight against Gath, and he took it. And Hazael set his face to go up to Jerusalem. So this Hazael went up against the coastline cities. Now he's coming inland to Jerusalem to war against it. And Joash, instead of rounding up the army and the troops to fight against him, he did something that uh, probably should not have, because from here is when his rulership went downhill fast. So instead of riding his army out to meet this Hazael, it says in verse 18, And Joash king of Judah took all the hallowed things that Jehoshaphat and Jehoram and Ahaziah, his fathers, kings of Judah, had dedicated to the Lord, and his own hallowed things, and all the gold that was found in the treasures of the house of the Lord, and in the king's house, and sent it to Hazael, king of Syria, as a gift, as a, a payment, as a peace project, as a bribe. Please don't attack us. We'll make peace with you. He took all the holy things and gave them to a non-believer. He gave them to the pagan, the ungodly. That's never a good sign. Sometimes you've got to have business dealings out in the world because you have to, because 99.9% .9 of the world is godless. And there's a very small remnant of people that actually love Jesus Christ, even in the churches. You go to a church and you think, oh, you know, everybody's in love. And no, they're not. It's a very small percentage, even in the churches, that are actually in love with Jesus Christ. Many people have a lot of different reasons, I don't know why, for going to church and being part of a church ministry, even part of the, the ruling, you know, hierarchy in the churches. But they do. I guess it's a comfortable job. So we have to do business with non-believers out in the world. They supply everything, clothes, hat, food, you know. There's, Christians don't control everything. We are a very small, small, small minority the only real true minority in the earth. Because Jesus said, will he find the faith on the earth when he comes for the rapture? When the rapture comes, we're going to be caught up together. We're going to be gone. And Jesus is just making a statement a very few. Because it's everything. And we are going to go against the grain of the world and all that the world, you know, puts to the surface of, isn't this great? This is great. For it's always has a seed and a cutting of godlessness, and they never give glory to God. So this was a huge mistake for Joash to give this king Hazael of one of the states of Syria, a payoff bribe to not attack them. So he took that which was the Lord's and he gave it to non-believers, the pagan, the godless. This stuff, this, these monies and these things were allotted to the worship of God, our God Yahweh, 
the Son of God, Yeshua, the Holy Spirit, Elohim, the one true God of Israel. They were set aside to worship God. You can't take what's God's and then pass it out to the world. You have to do business out in the world. I said that. But what you have set aside for the Lord's work, that's for the Lord. When you take it and you give it out to, you know, paganism, that's a problem. It's okay to go to food stores and, you know, markets and festivals and all those things. That's all part of living in life. But when you have monies that are set aside for missions and Bibles and the feeding of Christian poor people and sending off money to the Salvation Army here in America. You know, they, they're they kind of always there to help the poor people, the poor guys and women on the streets getting them meals, a shower, and a bed. They're, they're there. They're there. They take a priority. Let's move on. So they paid off Hazael, this king of Syria, with the Lord's money. And after this payment, he went away from Jerusalem. Now, I bet you this Joash regretted what he did. And a lot of things we've done in life, we regret. Sometimes, sometimes the Lord makes it right. Sometimes the Lord brings it back. You know, all the way around hundredfold and you say praise you Jesus thank you for rescuing me I made a stupid decision I made a stupid mistake thank you Jesus for bailing me out sometimes he doesn't we kind of choke on it of boy I shouldn't have done that and it's a, it's a very hard but learned lesson we don't really know how Jehoiada feels or Joash it seems now that the priest Jehoiada is kind of out of the picture. We don't really know if he's passed away or he's just kind of old or they're not getting along. We don't really know. But he's kind of not really in the picture of guiding Joash. But that was a bad decision. From here on now, his scepter seems to have been taken out of his hand. Like Jesus said to the churches, if you don't repent of your sins, I'm going to take my lampstand out of your church. So the, the church might go on. Like we have a lot of corporate churches. They're, they're involved in a, in a big association of churches and they're big. And But, you know, you don't see many people getting saved there. The teaching of the word of God is, you know, like slim to none. You, you can walk in and they're dry. They're dry as a bone, as a cemetery. Because, the Holy Spirit is not there because they have allowed too much in there, too much of the, you know, the Brokeback Mountain Boys movement, the, the HMOs, the rainbow stuff. They've allowed to say, well, this is all about love. And that's not love. But the Sodom and Gomorrah stuff is an abomination to God. It's being allowed in the churches. It's just, it's just part, of the, part of the plan, part of the wicked plan. So you can't have that stuff in your church and be a church. See, that's the kind of stuff you ask to leave, to get straightened out. That's part of the cleansing, because judgment begins in the household of God. That's when he starts clearing out the tares and the chaff and the pricker bushes and the thistles. As Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. Unfortunately, Joash kind of goes down a road that's displeasing to the Lord. And that that kind of passing away all the Lord's stuff and giving it out to the wicked man, it was a, a change. Change in his kingdom, change in his ministry. There was a change. And things kind of get unraveled here. 
Verse 19. The rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. And it says his servants, verse 20, arose and made a conspiracy and they killed him. They executed him in the house of Milo, which goes down to Silla. He was assassinated by his own people. Where were the guards? How did these people get in the house? It was like a conspiracy because God's hand had pulled away from him. It's kind of like Abraham Lincoln. I mean, he was in that, that, that orchestra house and he was sitting here in America and somebody just snuck up behind him with a gun and shot him. I always have said, where was his guards? Well, it was, must have been part of a grand plan to allow that to happen because obviously there was a, people weren't happy that, you know, the blessing of God had departed from him. We don't really know, but that's the question I ask. Or maybe, maybe I'm the one asking them questions. We move on. They they assassinated Joash by his own people in his own land, and Milo, which goes down to Silla. For Jazakar, the son of Shemeath, and Jehoazabad, the son of Shomer, his servants, smote him and they died, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David, and Amaziah, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, next time we get together in 2 Kings, we're going to pick up and we're going to see that the next king after him really went down into wickedness. That's going down from wicked man to a good man. Took a little bit good and then it goes back to a wicked man. You kind of see that flip-flop in Judah, in the southern kingdom. In the north, it's pretty patchy whether any of them were good kings at all. Jehu was good for a while, but then he had tolerated and allowed idolatry into the land very easily, unfortunately. He was a good king for a little while, but not for very long. So we finish up chapter 12 of 2 Kings. Some good, some bad. And that's that's kind of the way it is. You know, you can't have all good. There's going to be problems. If you're in a church, even a good church, you're going to have problems, sometimes real problems, bad problems, and you have to deal with it. You have a family, you're going to have problems. You have bunches of kids, you're going to have problems. Sometimes really bad problems. Sometimes it's just a matter of uh, getting them to spend a little time in the Word of God every day before they head on out for school or homeschool or, or whatever the chores. But there's going to be problems. And you have to deal with it and do the very best you can and make a decision. What makes a man a man and a woman a woman is the decisions and the choices that you make. Make your choices to please God and you can't go wrong. God bless you, friends. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.